Good evening, buenas noches, boa noite. My name is Rodrigo Moura, Rodrigo Moura. Uh, I'm the chief curator at El Museo del Barrio in New York. And uh, together with Alia Alba and Susana Vitenkin, I'm also uh, one of the curators uh, of Estamos Bien La Trienal 2021. Tonight, it is my honor and privilege to host the last of a series of talks between artists in the exhibition. And I thank Yanira Collado, Manuela Gonzalez, and Eddie uh, Aparicio for being uh, our guests. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, La Trianal is the museum's first national large scale survey of Latinx contemporary art, featuring more than uh, 40 artists from across the United States and Puerto Rico. And uh, it's also the first of a series of triennial exhibitions that expand on the S-Files series that took place between 1999 and 2013. While the two previous iterations of this conversation series uh, explore notions related to craft and representation, tonight we'll be focusing on form understood as a field for experimentations and new possibilities. In a show where identity plays such an important role, we were amazed to see how many artists had an interest in materials, processes, and form, as tools to explore as new possibilities for formalism and abstraction through the infusion of vernacular, indigenous, and other new non-Eurocentric anti-elitist visual codes. An interest of mine throughout, and I think of El Museo historically, it's to really uh, challenge and question the, the predominance and the homogeny of the, of the Eurocentric canon, in the art of the Americas. So these are uh, where we're coming from for tonight's uh, talk. And with this in mind, I'm very, we were very happy to put together a group of works by these three artists in a show, uh, in a room in the show, and the same artists who are you know, gathered in, in tonight's talk. So uh, I just would like to share with our uh, uh, audience tonight some of the installation views of this room uh, with two, uh, I guess, tapestries, how Eddie calls them, um, both on the, on the right uh, wall and uh, on the hanging space. Uh, some details of these two works uh, in close-ups, uh, another view of the room where we have works by Manuela uh, on the left uh, with Eddie's work, the, the, the back of Eddie's work hanging in the space uh, in the center and the quadro soap sculpture by Anita on the right. This is another uh, view of just the three uh, pieces by Anita. Uh, and another view uh, of um, the smaller scale works by uh, Manuela hanging on one of the walls. So we, throughout these works, we see an interest, as I say, in abstraction form and materials and processes, as well as an interest for uh, non-fine arts codes, visualities, techniques, and conversations. So I think it's extremely important to the understanding of this exhibition to really uh, think of identity, to really think of cultural identity and cultural conversations also as informing uh, formal works. No, so just a few notes before I'm done with my uh, uh, introduction about the panel's format and some uh, housekeeping uh, information. So uh, tonight's uh, panel, in the, tonight's panel, each of the artists in this order, Yamira, Manuela, and Eddie will present about their work for 10 minutes. And then we will uh, have a more uh, a conversation. I will uh, share some of my further thoughts about the topic of tonight's uh, panel. 
I propose that some of the artists uh, would also bring references to their work to make our uh, conversation even more exciting. And I also brought a couple of references of my own. Uh, so throughout the talk, please feel free to uh, enter uh, questions on the Q&A uh, box and that those will be answered in the last 15 minutes. But I brought, you know, from my, my own past and from my own heritage and my own interests as curator, uh, the work of two artists to be part of the conversation uh, tonight as well. So this is uh, uh, a Tesselar, who's a, which is a group of uh, woodcuts that Ligia Pape, Brazilian uh, neo-concretist, Ligia, Ligia Pape uh, dedicated herself to between the mid 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 fifties to early sixties, uh, a series of wood blocks, wood wood prints, where she was uh, creating geometric form as well as uh, referring to weaving. Uh, so I brought these two uh, wonderful tesselares where she was combining, you know, really trying to use the wood grain, the wood vein as a way to uh, to 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 play with this idea of weaving and uh, and uh, and um, and other again other vernacular uh, information I guess or, or or other vernacular fields as part of of uh, informing this uh, major uh, breakthrough in abstraction history, which was Brazilian neo concretismo in 1959. So these two works are from that era. And from a completely different latitude, uh, I also brought one example of the Vestigi collage of a collage series of Gieta Bratesco, Romanian, fantastic uh, contemporary art, uh, artist, uh, I mean, not so long ago, passed away, uh, where uh, Gieta was combining uh, pieces of uh, textile from uh, different sources, also to think about, you know, formal form and anti-form, and also bring uh, her own uh, uh, women, women history uh, into play in this in this work and this idea of the vestige, no, and this idea of uh, the previous uses of the of the fabrics, the you, as clothes, as becoming rags, becoming useless and being uh, re uh, combined in this uh, place of forms that were. Uh, in the center of Jeta's work. So I wanted to make this small contribution to tonight's panel by bringing those two uh, references. And without uh, much more, I would like just to ask uh, Yanira to be our first speaker tonight. And I will be sharing uh, Yanira's uh, uh, presentation with you. So thank you so much for being with us here tonight. And Yanira, please. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you for the reminder. Saludos, my name is Yanira Collado. And before anything, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody at Museo del Barrio for including me and so many of my fellow gente in Estamos Bien La Trienal. And for this current opportunity to be in conversation with Manuela Gonzalez and Eddie Aparicio to share a little bit of my experience and practice, which I, I just find a kindred spirit with both of them. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, I am a Dominican born in New York, raised in between Miami and Santo Domingo. And um, yeah, I'm going to start out with sharing some of the underlying influence in my practice. So yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is your first slide, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, bueno, uh, on the left, you uh, see a picture of my mother's window um, after Hurricane Andrew. As you can tell, the roof has been completely torn off. Uh, we, li we lived in Homestead, Leisure City. Uh, Hurricane Andrew hit in 1992, and we lived right where the center of the eye came over. Um, obviously, the uh, event had a strong impact on my life, but uh, so on the nature and voice of my work. Um, 
the this began kind of like a meditation, a continuous lifelong meditation on uh, the idea of removal of public and private histories. Uh, on the right, you're going, you see my mother's sewing machine and it brings a smile to my face. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in sewing factories. My mother, when she immigrated uh, to the United States, started working as a seamstress in New York and then in Miami. And uh, later on went on to run uh, many sewing factories. My father is a pattern cutter and also very, very adept at uh, construction work, manual, manual construction work. And so are my uncles. So there was always this piece of, uh, th there was always editing and addition to my house to make more and more space for the factory or the sewing equipments. So this really, these modes of assembly really influenced my life um, and my language. And um, I find, oh, sorry, next um, image. I have, uh, can you uh, put the next one up? Yeah, uh, no, the one of Gordon, yeah. Yeah, that one. So um, again, these mo modes of uh, assembly and deconstruction are notions that I uh, identify with in Gordon Marta Clark's works, you know, how he um, tears into and edits uh, pre existing uh, structures to reveal those things that you may have not considered uh, if he had not intervened this way. Um, I find this effort uh, complements my own interests. And on the right, um, is Belki Ayon's La Cena. Um, just, um, you know, her, I find that her use of geometrical principles to address an open spiritual dialogue is a kindred ship with my, with, with my work. Um, you know, this chemistry of fractiles and devotional strategies uh, embedded with Cultural, culture and tradition. Um, that's, um, I hope it to be evident in the works at Estamos Bien in my install, especially the Penumbras piece. This, um, oh, you can go to the next one. Okay, so um, this is, uh, these are two pictures of my installation here at Dimensions Variable Maya in Miami. The show was called um, If They Knew These Things, Reliquias Ocultadas. Um, so on the right, what you see is a sliver uh, of the uh, piece on the left, the, um, the foundation. So when you first walk into the room, your tendency is to walk into the other, into the space, your tendency is to walk into the other room and look through that portal that I cut, uh, this to provoke varying notions of uh, varying notions of viewing positions. So altering perception, just as I would say Gordon Marta Clark uh, did. Um, this, you know, and on, on the left, you can see when you come around, you see that it's a foundation and you, can, you see that it's misshapen and, and interrupting that space almost at an angle, right? Um, I want to mention also that this foundation um, alludes to a lot of foundations that you see in the Caribbean and a lot of Latin American countries too, where, um, at least in the Caribbean and in Miami, where they sit there for a long time. You know, we have a tendency to build up on our houses. And um, sometimes nothing happens for, for years. And so it's, a, it's also a way of being in the present, looking to the future and understanding past because it's built on a past structure. Uh, so, but um, what I was interested in is, is in abstracting this notion, uh, this use of abstraction, cha challenging the viewer to continuously reorient their great gaze. Um, this, um, this was to, get the viewer to have an experience, access more of an experience than anything else. Um, you, can, you can go to the next one. 
uh, you know, the experience connected to these possible histories uh, embedded and charged in the objects placed around the foundation, right? Geometrical forms, uh, things that you may think were just discarded, but you start to wonder about their value, reliquias ocultadas, and, or their history. Uh, you can go to the next one. So this is also part of the installation uh, at um, Dimensions Variable. Uh, this piece is part of um, the other side that you didn't see where the portal is. So here I'm again deeply invested in this application of abstract fractal patterns, you know, referring to fragmentation of histories through remnants. Okay, you can, and on the right you see the uh, detail for it. Okay, you can go to the next image. Okay, so these these patterns uh, drive much of the work in Estamos Bien. Uh, in this piece, uh, untitled uh, 2020, the, the intent is to um, create a structural component made up of these patterns. Uh, the soap is a soap we use in the Dominican Republic, well, in, in all of Quisqueya uh, to launder, but we also use it in devotional strategies uh, to ward away spells. And the piece is acting that way here in this installation is to ward away um, those forces that could possibly come to displace the history found in the larger piece, the Penumbras 124. Uh, you can, I'm sorry, keep forgetting. You can turn the, okay. So um, here I'm using that uh, same uh, patterning, but uh, to allude to uh, the guira, which is a percussion instrument um, deriving from uh, our Taino ancestors, right? And also um, the, the reason why it's leaning like this is to um, allude to the transcendence of, the, of a history. Um, I'm, also ref I'm also referring to the Bolonganfini mud cloths from Mali in, in the geometrical forms to create an, this architectural armor through overlapping, through layering, through irregular weaving of textiles, paint, paper, oil pastels. So you can move on to the next one. Okay. So this is the installation shot. And I respond to the world in a very sculptural way, in a very physical way. So I never think that anything is quite flat. You know, I have this perception that everything has depth. And so I, my intention is to always create this way to hopefully provoke um, the viewer to turn to look what's behind. This through layering or by hiding or embedding things to pique your interest or to have you physically engage with the piece. Um, and also, I do that as a, a strategy to protect the histories in those geometrical forms, usually. Uh, you can turn to the next one. Okay. This is also part of the installation, Aristamos um, Bien. I am quite drawn to materials that uh, are considered disposable, uh, easily accessible materials usually associated with uh, conserving or preserving uh, precious items. Um, um, very influenced by growing up in sewing factories and uh, the sewing industry, watching um, items come in and out uh, packaged through butcher paper and cardboard. Um, and another thing that's always present in these pieces, I call them quilt pieces, is this intention of labor, this evidence of labor that uh, influenced me heavily. Um, you can go to the last one. Okay, so in closing, I'd um, 
you know, I'm leaving you with this intervention. Uh, interven intervening is part of my practice. It's, and it, I have to say now that I think about it, it's quite easy to do here in sunny Florida all year round. Um, I, one of the things I do is I, I have a, a weekly practice where I go and I document structures that are being torn down. Um, and I either intervene by documenting the bones left of the structure or by placing an offering. Uh, this one, you could tell I um, place an offering on the left side. It is a quilt made by gel medium transfers and paper. And so with that, I will close and open the door for Manuela. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you so much, uh, Yanira. That was, that was really fantastic. So uh, Manuela. Great. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Manuela Gonzalez and uh, I'm also one of the artists in, in La Triennale. And like Janita, I feel really honored and excited to be in conversation with both of these artists and Rodrigo. And uh, thank you all so much for all your time and energy. Um, so what I would like to do with these 10 minutes is talk a little bit about the pieces that I have in the show, the process behind those pieces, and some of the things that I've been thinking about uh, in relationship to that work. Uh, so what you're looking at here uh, is one of the pieces that are hanging in, in La Triennale. And it's a piece that um, I made first through the process of collecting, accumulating, discarded, thrifted, recycled pieces of cloth, mostly uh, kind of like domestic objects such as blankets, bath mats, curtains, um, all these different types of objects that, you know, had a previous life, which uh, I love, you know, just hearing all the connections between our work, Danita, because you were talking about something like that before. And um, I assemble those pieces together through a collage-like process, through sewing, through gluing, to create this texture that then I use as a canvas for painting. So what you're looking at here are painted patterns that I have sort of worked on this like abstract painting that I've developed uh, with paint on top of these textures that I create. Um, and something that I'm th I, I was thinking a lot about it, and I think a lot about with this body of work and all the pieces that are on view at La Triennale right now are these connections between formalism between the grid, between, you know, like abstraction developed in the 20th century and these forms of making that are not considered fine art, but that have existed for thousands and thousands of years, uh, how I can create artworks where there's like a dialogue between both of those traditions, where they are sort of like um, intervening with one another, where um, it kind of like invites you to, you know, look closely to uh, see like, you know, the places where I'm referencing both and we're both sort of blend together. Um, something, uh, we can move on to the next one, Rodrigo. Uh, something that really inspired me to uh, start making work like this was thinking about artists like uh, Ligia Pape, artists uh, from the, you know, starting in the, in the 50s who have thought about this like blend of textile work with, uh, with abstraction, but also just like really thinking about, you know, activating like canvas as a material. Because if we think about it, thinking about the fact that this is a woven surface and weaving is something that, you know, like the first we we weaving found was found from 1700 BC from the prehistory and it's a piece of plaid. And, you know, this is something that has informed a, like the development of abstraction so much and really thinking about how I can kind of like create my own surface to really things like and activates us thinking about this process of how these surfaces were made. And um, so we can move on uh, to the to the next one. But so I, I would like to share uh, with you some of the other, you know, the specific things that were personal to me that got me to start thinking about these ideas. So um, I grew up in Medellin in Colombia. I immigrated to Florida when I was uh, around 14. And uh, from really early on, I started going to, you know, I went to an arts high school and started getting a very formal arts education. Uh, but, you know, the more artwork I made and the more I started experimenting with material, with color, with form, uh, the more I started thinking back farther than that to 
the process of making that I grew up around, like Janita, you were showing the your mother's sewing machine. Uh, for those of you who got to see my Instagram take, uh, takeover, you saw that I got to interview my grandmother, Blanca Gaviria, and this is uh, her quilt. And she's been making quilts for the last 15 years, but just like your mother, Janita, she, you know, her whole life, she was making dresses, she was doing alterations, she was working with fabric and making objects for the function of care for loved ones. And it wasn't just my uh, grandmother, but many women in my family uh, engaged in that process of creating visual material in the function of care. And this is something that has been really inspiring for me and that I wanna reference with the work. Um, so you can, in this specific pairing, you can really see sort of like the aesthetic influences from my grandmother to my work, these choosing of fabrics that, you know, for me maybe felt intuitive, but that come from this early aesthetic education. You know, we're taught to like, you know, we, we start to um, learn how to like from such an early age and that sort of permeates and, and affects the way we make work as artists later on. Later on and that's an idea that is uh, very important to me. We can... Um, so besides fabric, I, I really like to sort of expand that and think about other, you know, no, non-formal abstract practices that have uh, influenced my work. Uh, like I said, I'm from Medellin and anybody from Colombia actually will, will recognize this image, but there's a big festival in Colombia that happens in, in, in August every year called La Feria de las Flores. And uh, you know, the, Medellin is, a, is really huge for flower production and, and, ex, and uh, exports. But these are these really intricate pieces of art made with flowers that people themselves grew and then assemble and come to the city and parade around in them. And this festival has been happening once a year uh, in Medellin since 1957. And, it, you know, even before I got a chance to go to an art museum, because I didn't really get to do that until much later in life, this was the art or the kinds of things that I got to see around in my environment all the time, where these hijetas, where these quilts that I was showing you before. Um, so, yeah, I, I wanted to share that just to bring in kind of like a different piece of information that you can contrast the work to. And I, I mean, with the work, it's really obvious that I'm using a lot of florals, but it's also like this idea of creating with texture that I, I feel really connects to these hijetas and, and this tradition of, of making objects. We can go on to the... Um, so besides my grandmother's quilts, uh, when I first started uh, going to school for painting, and you know, learning about like the history of art in a more in a more formal way, I also came across the the quilts of Jeeves Bend and the quilts of uh, Annie Mae Young. And for me, these were just so mind blowing. And I just looked at them even before I was making work that referred uh, to quilting, just because to me there's something so you know these were made in this tiny uh, rural community in Alabama that was really isolated. But some of the ideas and the materials and the processes used here, I connect to so many other uh, ways of making that I was exposed to as a kid, including you know, the objects that my grandmother would make. But I also just think about this repurposing of, of um, discarded objects that Janita was talking about, um, but also thinking about arpilleras in Chile, you know, women making uh, these quilts out of the clothes of their disappeared loved ones, just, you know, this like kind of repurposing of objects that we associate with the home, that we associate with people we love and repurposing those to create something that is like painting in so many ways. We can, great. Um, and I mean, I, I think with uh, the piece that Rodrigo was showing before, uh, the Ligia, Ligia Pape, those, those connections become very, very evident, those connections between geometric abstraction, you know, abstract formalism from the like uh, mid 20th century and, uh, and quilting. But I think this is kind of like an example. Carmen Herrera is somebody whose work I actually didn't really learn about until maybe seven, eight years ago, but who I just keep going back to over and over again. And I'm just really interested in 
you know, like this language that you create so minimally. And, you know, my work in a way is like the opposite of minimal, but um, I, I, I am interested in these like small moments of connection and small moments of like your geometry sort of plays off of each other and creates its own, its own language. And I think, you know, this piece where you can kind of see like the shadow versus the light playing, you know, with geometry, you can start to see those connections. But this piece, I think, is, you know, one where you can really see like those connections between, you know, weaving, quilting, uh, you know, and geometric abstraction. Um, but her pieces, her Blanco y Verde series, maybe some of you might know with like triangles and just taking canvases to get uh, apart and putting them together really is sort of something that activates the canvas as a surface in a way that's really um, interesting and really has been really informative for me and my practice. Uh, and I, this, I, I've been thinking about Jack Whitten's painting so much uh, over the last few years. I went to see uh, his show at the, at the New Met, uh, the Met, the Met Brewer, and I just was so blown away by all the work in that show. But an idea that really sort of uh, stuck with me is this idea of abstraction as portraiture or like abstraction as a way to sort of like allude, a, you know, to history or allude to, to you know, people that you want to think about in your practice. And uh, this is, you know, an example of many pieces in that show that were, were named after important historical figures uh, for the Black community. And, you know, I've been thinking about his work with in you know in terms of like the texture in my work the the playing with different objects you know creating these kind of pieces that do really different things from far away and from up close but also just like thinking about like this idea of abstraction as portrait and thinking about all these patterns that i use as uh you know objects that somebody painted as things that remind me of something that i wore or somebody that i love it war and kind of like, you know, complicate this abstraction in a way that I find uh, really, really interesting. Um, and I also, you know, just, I, I mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, but I wanna acknowledge that this project that I'm working on, this idea of, of playing with, with this inter intersection or this conversation between a text, textile history and formalism isn't, you know, new to me. There were so many artists before me, including, you know, Miriam Shapiro, Faith Ringgold, all these artists who were sort of like, you know, playing with like pushing that line and, and defying these limitations and categorization between both ways of making. Um, so I am interested in sort of acknowledging that history and, and seeing it, uh, how I can contribute to that from the perspective you know, of somebody who's coming from like a, who's an immigrant, who's coming from, from a different culture, who maybe has had different, slightly different personal experiences to that. Um, but I do just really love how, you know, like this un universal, this language of like textile can feel regardless of sort of like what, what you're quoting. Um, and uh, just to wrap things up, I wanted to end with a, a couple of pictures of, of my process, just to ground it a little bit uh, on that. Uh, this is what I was like talking a little bit about before, where you can see sort of me collecting this, you know, in this one, I'm even reusing old paintings that didn't work, cutting them up, reassembling, creating sort of like this texture in which the paint becomes activated in which kind of like the, you know, when you come up close, you be, the, the, the pigment becomes deconstructed and it's sort of my way to get you to think, you know, about the, the surface of the canvas as, uh, as information, as much as like the painting as information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manuela. So uh, now Eric, thank you. Last but not least. Uh, you can go to the next uh, the slide. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Rodrigo, and everybody at Museo for inviting me to be a part of the show and a part of this conversation. And thank you to Yanira Manuela for sharing 
your work and being so open about your processes, it's really, I have so many questions now, but I'll just focus on this and then we can <laughs> get to that. This is one of the pieces that's in the show at Museo. It's the uh, City Bus Memorial. It's a piece that I made, a series that I started in about 2015, where I started um, coming from a painting background I just like I feel like I struggled for so many years to find a material and a way of working that for me like felt like I don't know I just struggled so much with painting like I went to school on the east coast I grew up in LA um, my father is from El Salvador he came here in the 80s my mother is from the U.S. but they were both involved in the kind of solidarity movement and the you know the civil war for however long that that lasted for and so that kind of really inspired me to kind of make work about this kind of intersection of cultures between, you know, the United States was specifically Los Angeles and El Salvador and Central America and the kind of relationships between history. And so um, I was looking for processes that were outside of like my, you know, composition, if that makes any sense. And so after going to El Salvador for a long time, I ended up touring these uh, rubber factory, these were kind of rubber plantations and being really interested in this, um, like the, the tapping of the trees, the scarring of the trees and the extraction of the um, latex, the, and, you know, the latex is kind of the internal fluids of the tree. It has a similar function to, um, you know, our blood and that it moves nutrients through the body and it heals wounds. And so I became really interested in that kind of relationship to the body and to kind of the connection to these tree species um, as a way of talking about not just the immigrant experience, but the experience of also of these trees. These are ficus trees, which were brought into LA in the you know 50s and 60s because they grow really rapidly and they have these really wide trunks and a lot of shade. But what they didn't realize is that the reason they can do that is because they have these buttressing roots that come out almost like a Gothic cathedral, it has these like buttresses that hold up the walls. And so you can see the roots of those um, and then they break up. Um, so, you know, two thirds of the way up on the piece, you can see actually the texture of the piece changes because that's the height that humans can reach on the surface of the tree in the street level. And so these trees are in mostly Salvadoran communities like Pico Union and some in Boyle Heights. And so for me, they became these documents of place. Um, I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, Yanida, you mentioned documenting as intervening. And I really loved that idea of like, just that the act of witnessing became this interaction with that history and with that space. Um, and I kind of was imagining that these also, you know, so basically what I do is like, I was coating the surfaces of these trees in this liquid rubber. And then over, you know, a long period of time, it builds up and then I'd peel them off. And so what it is, is it's basically kind of like a record or a document of that place. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is a show I did in 2018 at the Mistake Room here in LA, where previously I was, um, you know, backing my these rubber works with canvas or linen um, and putting them on the wall, thinking of them almost as paintings. But I just started really thinking about my project of wanting to find a material that was like connected to the histories that I was, you know, referring to. Um, and so I started, um, you know, I noticed I started basically found finding clothing for my family, clothing that was on the street next to, in the same communities that the trees were made in and things that I was wearing when I made the piece and started rubbering those and kind of integrating them into the backs of these pieces. This is a show that I did with my father. Um, he made these series of paintings and wood sculptures when he first came in, from 82 to about 92, um, which is kind of documenting his experience during the Civil War and also with my grandma's works. Um, if you can skip, go to the next slide. So these are actually dolls that my grandma, Abuelita Pasita. Can, can you, sorry, Eric, can you share their names with us? Sure, yes, I was just getting to that. <laughs> uh, my grandma, Abuelita Pasita, we called her Maria de la Paz Aparicio Torres. Um, and she died in 2000, but she made, starting when she was in a, a refugee in Nicaragua, fleeing the Civil War in El Salvador, she was fine, she was using the clothing of her, <clears throat> sorry, of her family members, some of which had disappeared to make these dolls um, and my father would actually bring them back to the United States and I would sell them at my father's art shows and we'd send that money back to her. So she, as a way of like supporting all of the children that she was taking care of. And so um, this is one of the paintings that my father made. His name is Juan Edgar Aparicio. Um, this was a painting from 1992, I believe. And 
his what his daughter Carolina was disappeared during the Civil War, but <clears throat> he had another daughter um, who's my full sister, Carolina, who was when he paid, made this painting was the same age as the age of his daughter when she was disappeared. And so she actually stood in as the model. And I just found that, you know, we're all named after people. And so I found that like almost thinking about our bodies and our, the history of ourselves as a material that had this kind of, you know, extended history. Um, so I really wanted to share these paintings. You know, we, I grew up with these dolls. I actually never really got to meet my grandma because I was, you know, stuck here in the US and she was there and she died when I was very young. So um, I knew her mostly through these dolls. And actually when I was installing this show, the edges of the works are all sewn with this stitch that I kind of just like was my the intuitive way that I wanted to seal the fabrics with the rubber. And I was walking out of the show and I realized that it was the same stitch that all the edges of her fabrics and all the dolls like seams were all sewn with. And then it's what they call it, Diente del Lobo. And it's like a, it's a stitch that's made, um, that's used um, basically to sew the edges of baby blankets. And it's kind of this protective stitch. And I just like, really made me think a lot about the gestures that me and you know we all as humans like intuitively pick up from our family members you know whether it's them folding clothes or making food or you know all of these like the ways that hands are used and we observe and we kind of pass those on from generation to generation and really thinking and wanting to kind of like figure out or think more about the ways that we make art and how those things become embedded in them um go to the next slide this is one of the works that's in the uh, in the gallery in the show at La Triennale. It's called El Rido del Bosque Sin Hojas. And actually, it was this woman who came to see the show at the mistake room. Um, and she was walking through and seeing these, you know, they were like the largest rubber cast I had. There was about 18 feet. And so she was seeing these kind of tree trunks without the leaves. And she was recalling her experience in El Salvador. Um, during the Civil War, the U.S. was supplying the, um, the paramilitary groups with all of this napalm and white phosphorus, and they were going with these like U.S. planes spraying huge percentages of the forest in El Salvador with napalm, and it would burn all the leaves off of the trees so they could see aerially where the guerrilleros were hiding, and you know entire villages, you know animals, people being coated in this um, in this napalm, and she was just you know she'd walk through these forests and it was just these forests. And so I really started thinking about the sound of that and it kind of really affected the way I was seeing my work. Um, I started, you know, with the added addition of clothing on the back. So I was really thinking of these as uh, skins and, you know, and then having the clothing with them. But um, so I wanted to make, you know, to make a series of works that was related to that feeling that, she, that you know, she shared with me. So I started collecting glass bottles from my friends and family here in LA you know, there are wine bottles and glass bottles and I started smashing them on the ground and then picking up all the shards of the glass and drilling holes in them so I could sew that same stitch to have them hang from all the edges of the works. Um, and so when you walk around the piece or it moves a little bit, it kind of all the pieces of glass all hit together. And I was just really thinking about that as like a memorial to the sound of these forests with no leaves and, you know, the, that rustling of life. Um, and the kind of like absence of like branches hitting each other um, and also kind of referencing the history of, you know, this protective barrier. They're actually very sharp, um, as I learned from the thousands of them that I had to drill every day. <laughs> um, and just um, this idea of a protective barrier um, as a way of the, you know, I, this was at, this was originally shown at Commonwealth and Council before I went to La Tienan. And one of the people there was like, oh, but what if, you know, someone touches the work and they cut themselves or it travels? And I was just thinking, you know, the work actually, like, why can't we have works that also have the agency for, to protect themselves? And I think a lot about kind of collaborations with materials and um, like the height of the work is the height that I could reach um, in the, in, you know, when I was making the piece and the width of the work is just the entire circumference of the tree. And so thinking about the form of the work as being this collaboration between me and this tree and this community and also the material that it comes from. Um, and then the back of the work was for me, um, I was making these, I'm thinking of those documents, the front side, the rubber casting, you can see there's graffiti and carving and car exhaust and all of that becomes integrated into the rubber. And so I really like this idea of like, it helped me you know, understand my relationship to the history of painting um, and the kind of my struggles with my hand, my ego and this composition and the kind of maleness, the whiteness of all of that. I was just like, 
having difficulty using that language being, you know, coming from this amazing history of abstract expressionism, geometric abstraction, and, but just not being able to correlate that to the things that the references that I understood. And so I really love this idea of integrating other people's marks into the composition of the work. But then the back became this place where originally they were hidden against the wall, but then I decided to show them um, their collaged fabrics, but they're also this references to painting. Um, you see the Geo Groups logo there. They're the largest um, for-profit um, prisons for detainees in the United States. And so that becomes buried in this history. In, this references, um, I wish I had kind of put some of these images on, but the references for me are in El Salvador and a lot, a lot of places in Latin America, paintings and you know graffiti and logos are all painted onto the landscape on, on the side of the roads. And so I really became inspired by the way in which the integration of landscape and the integration of these like painted references and the kind of way that the landscape crumbles and it becomes this kind of like, um, you know, palimpsest of painting of uh, different marks and making. So I started to kind of integrate those onto the backs of the work. Um, we can skip ahead. All. Here you can see a detail of the pieces of glass. And yes, there's uh, this is another piece. Oh, we can we can actually skip ahead. Um, this is a piece. Um, oh, I think the titles are off on this one. That's okay. It's uh, aquellos que apuntan con el dedo medio. Um, so those who point with the middle finger and it actually became a reference to, I made this in 2016, right when Trump was elected. And I was thinking about this. Um, so there's a, a thumbtack at the tip of every one of these middle fingers on the top of the piece and the whole gesture and the weight of the works kind of falls on that. Um, but for me, it was actually my father and a lot of the old generation in Salvador, they all point with their middle finger because it was before the Americanization of what that middle finger meant. Um, and so they still have this idea. My father, he still points with his middle finger everywhere. He's like, and then I'm like, oh, you can't, you know, that means something different. <laughs> but I really loved this like cultural difference of signification of the body and the signification of, um, you know, what these symbols mean and the kind of complete opposite. And so on the one hand, the entire gesture and the weight of the work falls on this big, you know, 20 fuck yous. And also it's this pointing upwards, almost like this hopeful act. So I really loved that kind of, um, that cultural difference. And growing up in LA in mostly Central American communities here, for me, like I never really lived in El Salvador. Some of my siblings did end up moving back there. My dad lives there now, but um, for me, so much of what I understand about my family's culture comes from growing up here. And so I like, it's kind of this confluence of like um, these trees, they, come, they came from Indonesia, the ficus trees, but they're so integral, you know, to our understanding of the space. Um, so we can skip to the next one. I know probably a bit over. Um, this is a the Dollar a Colón. This was a, a couch that was a, an old couch was brought out on the street in front of the um, the tree that I was casting in Pico Union, and I loved all of the wares of the body onto the surface of that. So you can see, they, and then they actually put these patches, thinking that they looked like the color of the leather. And uh, I painted the Colón, which is the original, you know, the original, that's what I thought was the, now the El Salvador has a, um, a dollar, the dollar is its national currency, but before it was the Colón. And I painted this originally thinking that that was like some kind of pre-imperial, you know, currency. And then it was sitting there on Columbus Day, realizing that it was just the Colón, it was Cristóbal Colón, it was like the Spanish currency. So it's a kind of previous iteration. And I don't know why, it, like, took me so long to realize that. So actually this is uh, on the bottom is um, Cristobal Colón's signature. And I just figured like he took credit for so much, you know, finding this new world. And so he might as well take credit for the painting. Um, so anyways, I can skip ahead a little bit. Let's, um, this is the last piece I'll show. This is the newest work I've done, uh, Panza del Público, which is a public sculpture here in uh, Los Angeles State Historic Park. And it's based off of the sacred Saba tree, which has all these thorns, these protective thorns that grow in the trunk of it. Um, and I kind of reconceived this project during the pandemic to also have a functioning wood fire oven inside of it because my father and his mother in Salvador, they, you know, they grew up in, well, my grandma grew up in a canton which had no electricity, no running water. And so it's very common to have these large public ovens where people would come and make food and, you know, your neighbors would come. And so I really wanted to offer that into this public park. So we're having, you can skip to the last slide. Or just the next one, yeah. And so you see, there's the, I made all these ceramic thorns during the pandemic, also making bread um, at the same time. And then this is uh, Michelle Lainez, who's a Salvadoran chef, amazing 
person here who we collaborated on this large event where we made quesadillas, Salvadoran quesadillas, and all these amazing Salvadoran foods and had a long talk about the history of materials and history of ovens. So thank you so much. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Eddie. That was amazing, everyone, all the three of you really um, did great with time, actually. <laughs> so thank you so much for being so mindful of that. That will certainly uh, allow us to have a little bit more of conversation. So I would just like to start by pointing to like two, uh, like a fake opposition, but like an opposition for us to get started from somehow. One, one thing I think there's like an art historical thing going on here, like the art historical perspective. No, that's, I think it's very present in Manuel's presentation. It somehow percolates uh, Yanira's um, um, talk to in different ways. And I think this is in mine, you know, my, my preface to the, to the talk. And I think that's interesting how we, as time passes, how are we, uh, we continue to, um, I guess, uh, reinterpret, reappropriate from art history and, uh, and, and make it into something different, not to, to not don't take it for granted don't take it as a like a stable uh discipline but to really make it more uh to open it up and to make it more complex and to make it more uh what we need it to be for us as curators as artists as scholars the other thing which i think it's kind of in friction with that it's really the dimension of the experience no i think that's um I think, I mean, from my perspective, and maybe you guys have a different uh, view, you know, I think identity has a major role here in the States, you know, in the, term of the whole politics of the arts, but there was a big separation be between the, what's the art sphere and what's, you know, the, the life, you no, know, or the experience. And I think a lot of what your works are doing is bringing the experience into, uh, into the, you know, your experiences as the authors or the creators of those works, but also experiencing at large, you know, the idea of experience uh, as, as a very uh, key component to, to the art, you know, practice. You no, know, I think of like family, something that appeared in everybody's presentation. I think this is really interesting. Uh, I don't remember family being, I mean, of course, if you go to our history, you can think of family, you know, like for the portrait of my mother or something like as something present biographically, but I never thought of it so much in terms of like informing one's work as, uh, as I'm thinking of it now, you know, recently, especially with this show, that's one thing. But the other thing is like the different trades or different skills or different practices or knowledges being uh, more informative of the work. No, so I wanted to leave it there just to point out to these two polls as possibilities for discussion for us. I mean, are there convergences between them? I mean, how, how much uh, can we talk about like a complete separation between the two or, you know, just leave it there and for any, you know, any thoughts you had. I, as Eddie, I had so many questions about the work itself uh, that we can, uh, we can, you know, pick up from later. But that, that was my contribution just to get them. Uh, maybe we do the same order. Bueno, with me, uh, the experience is something that I definitely try to provoke, evoke in installation in my works. Uh, being that it's sculptural, there I have that one uh, position where I can engage the body, the viewer, and almost have them uh, dance with the piece, right? And, you know, I've, I also through abstraction, I try to evoke this sense of experience, right? Excuse me. Uh, I try to evoke this sense of experience and, you know, leaving a space for the viewer, not 
to experience the smaller things that are in there or um, to really digest, right? Um, I, to me, abstraction is an act of generosity, you know? Uh, I'm able to walk into an abstract space or an abstract piece and identify with it or question it. And in that way, I'm creating an experience. Yeah. That makes me think about this idea that sometimes the more specific you get, the more universal you get. I mean, and I don't know, I know that what you're saying is like, is a different thing, but I was thinking about what Rodrigo was mentioning about us, to, as, as making work about family and about specific skills and things that maybe like relate to identity or to our specific experience and how then we're making things that are quoting this, like maybe more, I don't want to say universal, but at least more, um, you know, uh, acceptable or known within the Western art canon and integrating them. Maybe this is kind of like a way of opening that up and making it kind of like more accessible or, or expanding the lens a little bit more is to become kind of more specific and insert your own personal experience into that dialogue. So, I, you know, this idea of like abstraction as generosity makes me think about that, makes me think about kind of like zooming in as a way to zoom out. Yeah, you know, I was the first thing I thought of when you asked that question, Rodrigo, was um, when I was in school, I was told like I was starting to make work, not the work I'm making now, but the kind of I imagine to be the predecessor of that. And I was told that my family history and that this particular, you know, fixation, fixation that I had on, you know, these experiences was a burden that word that came up, came up all the time. And it was like I was so offended by that. But for me, it was this catalyzing moment where I started to think of it uh, um, as more of as a gift you know, and the, our family experiences and even the trauma that we experience or that our families experience or that our communities experience as a gift only in the sense that we have this deep understanding of what it means. And that kind of goes back to this experience. The experience of going through something is a gift in a, in a, in a small way because it gives you a lens to that emotional experience. And, you know, I don't know, I just, so I really think a lot about, you know, this idea of the gift of closeness to certain ideas and cultures and, you know, thinking about, you know, the alienation of our history in terms of how these ideas of abstraction have been kind of co-opted from this like mostly white art world mm -hmm. and the, the ways in which like, you know, us to reinterpret that through our own experiences, through materials, through an abstraction of the abstraction is in a way reclaiming the origins of that, which has to do with craft, it has to do with functionality has mm -hmm. to do with all of these things that the abstraction was integral to a daily experience and an understanding of culture and of a life that was beyond this idea of this ego of the male white artist making these abstract paintings and somehow that was supposed to be universal for everybody almost painting white maleness as neutrality or as I don't know so I could go on a lot about it but I do oh, I think I think there's something really interesting that you said that it's this idea of uh the colonization, not uh, colonizing abstraction. Also, I mean, that's this idea that that didn't exist before, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, that you could not visually communicate through uh, non-figurative art. And that's very, I think that's extremely problematic in the art of the 20th century, you know, that that's this, uh, you know, big, uh, construct that, you know, people invented abstraction. I don't think abstraction was invented by the 20th century artists, no? So I think, I mean, maybe the notion of abstraction, how, how it's represented by the avant-garde is some invention of the avant-garde themselves, but abstraction at large, no, I mean, that I'm sorry, that existed for centuries in different cultures, in different visual codes. And I think that's one thing that is important to, to acknowledge. The other one, it's the fact that actually uh, every um, everybody has different backgrounds and, and, and formations, you know, more formally or less formally. But this is something that Manuela said that I thought was really interesting during her presentation. The aesthetic education doesn't start in, in art history, you know? So I think there's an education of the senses or, or like a cultural education that precedes that, you know? So I think that's also an interesting so, you know, like oppositions, you know, we were talking about our history and uh, the experience. Also, I think this is interesting you know, to push back on, the, on this 
invention of abstraction idea, which I think he has, you know, all the, you know, the white male uh, dominant or hegemonic discourse in favor of, you know, and the, the big idea of like the, the, uh, voiding art of any content or, you know, making it like a pure idea of like, uh, uh, like a pure visual uh, experience. But on the other side, we have also this idea of like the aesthetic, uh, aesthetic education as something that precedes the notion of art also. You know? So I think that's another fake opposition, you know, curators and art historians, they love fake oppositions. That's another one that I would like to bring uh, to the table. I don't know any thoughts about that or any just other comments. I would like to have you for more 10 minutes. So feel free to, you know, just throw questions at one another too. You know, for me, this idea of abstraction and what you were talking about, uh, people that feel that they, they, they have discovered these concepts and then incorporated them into their work. Um, uh, you know, you, the word in Spanish is ajeno, right? I don't know the English word for that, ajeno, not yours, not belonging. Yeah, uh, uh, someone else, no? Yeah. yeah. And um, I find that uh, for me, it's a matter, you know, I, this is practice culture for me. It, it's embedded in my language, in the way I think. It's practiced abstraction. I, you know, and so, you know, to uh, produce this work, to produce this work, it, I don't have to search outside of myself. And I think more and more, well, at least in, at the work in uh, Museo del Barrio, I really appreciate that that shows up a lot, that it's a, a genuine practice of this language, of abstraction, of, of this, this patterning, of this culture, of the way we composition things and the way we speak about things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yanina and Manuel, I think you guys both were mentioning this idea of abstraction and generosity. And I was just like correlating that to something that Rodrigo was just saying, which was like this generous action of abstraction in the terms of allowing other people to bring their experiences to and to have their own understanding of what that means to them. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that also allows for this colonization to happen in that this, gener this generousness of abstraction from cultures from all over the world that aren't necessarily, you know, from Western mm -hmm. um, sources allows itself to be kind of co-opted in this way of like, being removed and not necessarily showing its source or, you know, not, not that anything has one source, but I don't know, it's just like correlating the idea of generosity to a predisposition, you know, this almost like taking advantage of generosity, which is, you know, is like a toxic yeah. thing that we see in a lot of people in our lives <laughs> potentially. Yeah. I just, I don't know, I was just having that sensation right now. Totally. And I, I think, you know, it, it's interesting to, because our conversation in a way is about taking sort of like, this like quote unquote pure formalism and us coming into it and bringing information that's specific to us, right? As a way to sort of like, you know, evolve that or think about it differently. And, you know, I think about it in a way too of like empowering or, or kind of taking more ownership over the work so that what you're describing Eddie doesn't happen because I don't know about you guys, but in my, you know, formal education and art, there was so much that was like pushed into my work in reference to my experience that had nothing to do with my experience, just from this kind of like outside perspective. So, you know, for me, kind of like adding content to my abstraction is also kind of like a way of taking ownership over like what I want to, uh, you know, the, what kind of experience I want people to have with it, uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah, for, for me, in the abstraction, my I'm never thinking about um, making it a gentle experience on those who do not understand what I'm talking about, and um, that that's the gift of owning that that language and that experience, right? I don't have to go away from myself to talk about this. That's the richness of it. Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, there have been uh, atrocities. Um, uh, occurred to uh, people in with this idea of generosity, right? Or this idea of uh, disrupting histories. But, uh, you know, it, the way I'm speaking about it is to also protect certain histories. Like you see, when I layer a lot, I'm abstracting certain histories and revealing 
just slivers of it uh, to indicate that there's a presence, but you have no access to distorting it. Yeah, I mean, in some degree, I would say that I would see in all three of our works this idea of like, this not actually being a question of abstraction, but as realism and describing that in terms of like an abstraction that then is codified with material intent, cultural knowledge in a specific way that is not necessarily like a difference even between abstraction and realism. Cause I almost imagine that like figurative things almost like to claim it. And so this say uh, this generosity of like not necessarily having to claim like map making, you know, the invention of map making as this idea of like, you know, claiming and boundaries and borders and this I don't know I, I see it in all three of our works even just from these presentations of um, the encoding through abstraction to this kind of specificity that almost tends more towards realism mm -hmm. and understanding of this depiction of experiences um, than something that is like purely abstract with the capital A in art historical terms which is like kind of devoid I don't know I, I won't speak too much too deeply about in general <laughs> terms but I don't know I was just thinking a lot about like the specifics of the way that we could reinterpret abstraction in this particular context and you know as almost realism mm -hmm. um, i love that and i the other thing that i love is like the politics of materials too mm -hmm. no? which i think is something that touches on this realism thing i mean i would like to call it more like literal than uh, you know like the limits of how literal materials can be i mean they can be transformed but they can be quite literal too no i think it this is interesting, you know, I mean, in the, your case, obviously the culture, no, it's something that it has a whole colonial history that I think you are referring to, but also the, you know, the, the, the very possibility of um, the transformative capacity of that material, you know, the, 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 the tr tr trans transformation ability that the material encompasses. Uh, in art, you know, like uh, from a perspective of uh, sculpture, I think that's that's really fascinating. But also in Janitas, I see a lot of the const. I mean, I'm, i you know, I'm fascinated about that. This idea of construction and destruction, or collage and decollage, you no know, playing into your work. And I think the reference to Mara Clark was so, I mean, really turned me on because it's this is an artist who was really doing abstraction in the most direct way possible. You know, it's also like this idea of realism, you know, in the not realism as representational, but realism as playing in the real world, you no? Know? So I think that's, and, and intervening and all. And I think Manuela, it's something that come, we get a lot in your show here, in your presentation here, is people ask about the the origins of the of the textiles, you no? Know? And specifically the ones that have, that have like a previous, I think, like history in cleaning and domestic uh, uh, existence. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that comes into you know. I, it's really, uh, I think, yeah, it occupies the, the work in an interesting way, you know. And it sort of plays with the you know with the with your motifs, you no? Know? Because you have a you have an interest for like motifs and patterns and. Mm -hmm. They're there, you no, know? and but uh, you know, there's always this sort of friction between what's painted and what's uh, underlying, or you know, like structuring, you know, giving the the form of the words. It's just mm -hmm. how I reacted to this idea of realism that I really love. Yeah. And with that, maybe we're coming to a close because we said we would just uh, uh, over uh, stay for a little bit, not. <laughs> A long time so I would like to thank you all so much uh, Yanira, Manuela and Eddie I mean it's really it, this was really wonderful because uh, first of all it was a wonderful opportunity to share more of your work from your perspectives which I think it's always like a big privilege to our audience so I thank you for that but it was also um, was also an opportunity to uh, bring that conversation that exists in the, in the exhibition space uh, into, you know, with your voices and uh, beyond the work. So I uh, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone who joined tonight. And I think that's it. <laughs>